Hello and welcome to Indus News live from Islamabad. I am Muneeb Hamid with the news of this hour. Let's begin with the headlines first. Azerbaijan's President Ilham Aliyev says Armenia must liberate Azeri territories to end the war over Nagorno-Karabakh. Earlier, the two sides accused each other of shelling civilian areas just hours after a latest agreement to defuse tensions was reached in Geneva. Nearly 1,100 people have been killed in the fighting that broke out on the 27th of September. The death toll from the 7th magnitude earthquake in Turkey and Greece has risen to 26, while over 800 people are injured. Ankara has reported 24 fatalities, while two people died in Greece. Rescue operations are underway as several buildings collapse in the Turkish city of Izmir. The first actor to play James Bond, Sean Connery, has died at the age of 90. He appeared in seven of the spy thrillers between 1962 and 1983. His acting career spanned decades and his many awards included an Oscar, two BAFTA awards and three Golden Globes. The COVID-19 infections tally in the United States has topped 9 million with more than 229,000 deaths. India has recorded 551 deaths and over 48,000 cases overnight as the country's caseload crossed 8 million. In Pakistan, 11 people have lost their lives to the virus with the death toll exceeding 6,800. Globally, coronavirus has claimed over 1.18 million lives and infected more than 45.4 million people. Well, these were the top stories. News is coming in detail after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Now let's have the news in detail. We'll start from Azerbaijan, whose president Ilham Aliyev says Armenia must liberate Azeri territories to end the war over the Nagorno-Karabakh region. In a tweet, he said Azerbaijan doesn't want any third country's involvement in the fighting. Earlier, the two sides accused each other of targeting civilian areas just hours after a latest agreement to defuse tensions was reached in Geneva. The pact with the co-chairs of the Minsk group called requires both countries to avoid targeting civilian areas but fell short of what would have been a fourth ceasefire. Now, nearly 1,100 people have been killed in the fighting that broke out on the 27th of September. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan says India is a fascist state inspired by Nazis. In an interview, Khan said India is a threat to all of its neighbours. He said just like how the Nazis wanted to get rid of the Jews, the RSS wants to rid India of the Muslims. Khan said Pakistan wants the United States to treat Islamabad and New Delhi equally on the Kashmir dispute. The Prime Minister added Pakistan has no favourites in Afghanistan. He added his country's only interest is any future government in Kabul does not allow India to operate against it. To a question, Khan said Pakistan can never recognize Israel unless there is a just settlement as per the relevant UN resolutions. About US elections, he said President Donald Trump is very unpredictable despite trailing Joe Biden in the opinion polls. Now, the U.S. says Indian hesitation in its border standoff with China has hurt Washington's bid to contain Beijing. According to the Indian media, U.S. State Secretary Mike Pompeo said this during his recent visit to New Delhi. Pompeo said India's hesitation in its confrontation with China is being watched closely across the world. India's Ministry of External Affairs spokesperson has rejected the report. Pompeo recently wrapped up a five-nation tour of Asia with a call for unity to counter China's influence. Now in Afghanistan, the government says the deputy head of Taliban's military commission for the Helmand province has been killed in an airstrike. 
In a statement, the Defence Ministry said eight Taliban fighters were also killed in the air raid in the Nava district. It added a large number of weapons and ammunition were also destroyed. The Ministry further said Afghan forces also killed 14 Taliban in the Uruzgan province. It said nine other fighters were injured after they attacked army outposts in the Dahra Wood district of the province. Meanwhile, Afghan military said two of its soldiers were killed while eight injured in an explosion near their outpost in Balkh province. The Taliban have not yet commented on the claims. Now, the death toll from the earthquake in Turkey and Greece has risen to 27, while over 800 others are injured. A seven-magnitude quake with an epicenter in the Aegean Sea rattled the two countries, causing several buildings to collapse. The shallow tremor also triggered a mini tsunami that flooded the Turkish city of Izmir and Greek island of Samos. Ankara has reported 24 fatalities so far, while search and rescue operations are underway in at least 12 buildings. Officials say over 100 people have been rescued in the Aegean Izmir province. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan says the government has mobilized all the means for rescue efforts. Erdogan also thanked Greek Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis, who called him to offer assistance. Athens has recorded two deaths on the Samos Island when some teenagers were buried under the debris of a building. The U.S. Geology Survey says quake struck at a depth of 10 kilometers, offering condolences President Hari Falvi and Prime Minister Imran Khan say Pakistan stands with the Turkish nation, extending every support to Ankara. Now Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has distanced himself from the position of French President on the issue of freedom of expression. Speaking about blasphemy in France, Trudeau said free speech doesn't guarantee needlessly hurting certain communities. Trudeau said freedom of speech is not without limits and it is necessary to act with respect for others in a civilized society. He said Canada defends freedom of expression but will not endorse shouting fire in a movie theater crowded with people. He said in a pluralist society, it is necessary to be aware of the impact of words, particularly on communities that still experience experience discrimination. Meanwhile, Indonesia's president said freedom of speech that insults the sacred values of religion cannot be justified. Earlier, Hezbollah's chief said France declared war on Muslims by publishing blasphemous caricatures. Moving on, Iraq security forces have dismantled protest tents on Baghdad's Tahrir Square and reopened Jumhuria Bridge. Authorities closed the bridge and protesters set up tents at the onset of the mass anti-government protests a year ago. Commander of the Operations Kas al Muhammad Dawi said today's operation was done in coordination with peaceful protesters. He said the rear square is an important economic center of the city. Traffic resumed on the Jamhuria Bridge right after the concrete walls were removed. Activists did not gather to protest the removal of tents. Anti-government protests last year shook the country and killed more than 500 people. Meanwhile, the United Nations says Israel's decision of making 5,000 homes in the occupied Palestinian territory is a clear violation of international law. A UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights has called for accountability as Israel records the highest rate of illegal settlement approvals. In a statement, Michael Link said the international community has to respond with more than mere criticism. He said the international community observes Israel's occupation and it sometimes objects but does not act to curtail the violations. Link added Tel Aviv has approved more than 12,000 settlements only in 2020. He said this acceleration of settlement growth worsens an already precarious human rights situation on the ground. While Hamas has condemned the U.S. decision of listing Israel as the place of birth for Americans both in Jerusalem. Yesterday, the U.S. Embassy issued the first ever passport to its national listing his place of birth as Jerusalem, Israel. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo announced the change and the policy a day earlier. He said Americans born in Jerusalem can now list either Jerusalem or Israel as their birthplace. Hamas spokesperson Hazim Qasim called the move aggression against the Palestinian rights in the occupied Jerusalem. It shows the recklessness from the American administration toward all the Arab countries who still recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Palestine. 
Now, the United States and Sudan have signed an agreement to restore Sudan's sovereign immunity. Sudan's Justice Ministry said the agreement will settle down the cases against Khartoum in U.S. court. In a statement, the ministry said the cases include the bombing of U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania in 1998. It says Sudan has agreed to pay $335 million to the United States for victims of the bombing incident. Earlier, President Donald Trump said the U.S. will remove Sudan from their list of state sponsors of terrorism. Washington listed Khartoum as a state sponsoring terrorism when Omar al-Bashir was president. Sudan has also become the third Arab country to normalize ties with Israel, mediated by the United States. Moving on, now, Libya's Prime Minister Faisal Siraj has withdrawn his decision to resign. Government spokesman Ghalib al-Zaklai said Sarvaj will remain in office until the ongoing intra-Libyan political dialogue comes to an end. In an interview, Sarraj said he took the decision in response to repeated demands to avoid the political vacuum in Libya. Now, this comes a day after Libya's High Council of State urged Sarraj to stay until a new presidential council is selected. Earlier, the UN Tripoli's parliament and Germany urged Sarraj to postpone resignation for Libya's higher interests. Earlier in September, Sarraj, who leads the Presidential Council, announced to transfer his powers to the executive branch by the end of October. Algerians are set to vote tomorrow on a new constitution. The government sees the referendum as a key part of its strategy to move beyond last year's popular unrest. Hospitalized President Abdel Majid Hadbon has pushed the referendum to quell the mass protests that ousted his predecessor. The new constitution will limit presidents to two terms, giving more powers to the parliament and judiciary. It would also allow the army to intervene outside the country's borders. Despite Abdel Aziz Bouteflika's ouster, the protest movement has failed to achieve its goal of an overhaul of the political system. Moving on, Georgians are voting to elect 150 parliamentarians today. 30 seats will be elected via the majority system, while 120 through the proportional system. A majority of polls suggest the ruling Georgian Dream Party is leading, but it's not clear whether it will be able to get more than 40% of the votes needed to form a single party government. Over 30 parties led by the opposition United National Movement have vowed not to form a collision government with the ruling party. Georgia is plunged in considerable economic crisis as authorities predict a 4% contraction due to the pandemic. Now, Tanzania's president, John Magufuli, has won the presidential election. The Electoral Commission says the incumbent president got 12.5 million votes, equivalent to 84%. The commission said Magufuli's main challenger, Tundu Lisu, of the Chadema party, bagged 1.9 million votes. Lisu has rejected the election as fraud and called for protest. A U.S. says the irregularities and the overwhelming margins of the victory raise serious doubts about the credibility of the results. A spokesperson for the State Department said the U.S. will hold responsible individuals accountable. The vote in the African country was marred by allegations of arrests of candidates and protesters. Also, Ivory Coast is voting in tense election after an opposition boycott and clashes over President Alessane Ouattara's attempt to secure a third term. At least 30 people have been killed in pre-election violence. After a presidential nominee's death, Ouattara announced that he will be running for a third time. Opposition candidates Pascal Afi Ngushan and Henry Conan Paddy said it is illegal to run for a third term and called for a boycott and civil disobedience. While they did not officially withdraw their nominations, Ouattara said he can run for third term under new constitutional change in 2016. Now, in a statement, the UN called for peaceful polls and urged all political parties to refrain from violence. The first actor to play James Bond, Sean Connery, has died at the age of 90. He appeared in seven of the spy thrillers between 1962 and 1983. His other films include The Hunt for Red October, Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade and The Rock. Connery's acting career spanned decades and his many awards included an Oscar, two BAFTA awards and three Golden Globes. He was knighted by the Queen at the Holyrood Palace in 2000. Morning is coming up in this bulletin after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Now, the 
COVID-19 infection tally in the United States has topped 9 million, with more than 229,000 deaths. Globally, coronavirus has claimed over 1.18 million lives and infected more than 45.4 million people. Details in this report. It has almost been a year that the first case of COVID-19 was detected. But at no point over the year, the world saw a sign of relief. The virus keeps breaking all records of devastation. As Latin America's death toll nears 400,000, most leaders in the region worry countries can soon face a battering second wave. Peru, with around 34,000 deaths, has one of the highest fatality rates per capita in the world. The key is to avoid infection because even if much progress Progress has been made, a person with serious COVID has a 30% chance of dying. That's the truth, 20 to 30% if it's severe COVID that requires a ventilator. The mortality rate in intensive care is still over 40%. The winter surge of the second wave of the coronavirus has created an operational tsunami in much of the European region. Belgium recently has been reporting twice as many daily cases as France. It also has one of Europe's highest mortality rates. Italy exceeded 30,000 daily infections for the first time, while German hospitals warn of resources shortage. In Spain, public clashed with the lockdown police to protest the curbs as they say they are left at the mercy of the local food banks to feed their families. We have reached 3,500 a day from 400 a month to 3,500 a day. That is to say, all the cases of vulnerability have been multiplied by 200. In this sense, I think there is a new concept, a new poverty. The profile is now different. These are people who are self-employed, entrepreneurs, TV presenters, circus workers, employees in entertainment industry. Over in India, authorities recorded 551 deaths and over 48,000 cases overnight. The country's infection tally has exceeded 8.1 million with over 121,000 deaths. Meanwhile, Pakistan has reported 11 COVID-19 deaths and 807 cases overnight. The health ministry says the country's death toll has reached 6,806. The ministry said there are over 12,000 active coronavirus cases in the country. It said out of nearly 333,000 countrywide cases, more than 314,000 have recovered so far. Meanwhile, Federal Minister for Planning Development, Asad Umar, has sought citizens' help for the compliance of SOPs. In a tweet, Umar urged people to take pictures wherever they see violations of rules and send them to the authorities. Now, Brazil's Vice President Hamilton Morao says the government will buy a Chinese COVID-19 vaccine that is being tested in the country. This comes after President Jair Bolsonaro said the federal government will not buy a vaccine from China's Sinovac. In an interview, Morao said Bolsonaro's stance was without substance. He said the government has already put the resources to produce this vaccine and will not run away from that. Meanwhile, the European Union says any vaccine in the territory of the bloc will have to comply with approval procedures. At a press conference, the European Commission spokesperson Eric Mama said all member states have signed up to this European vaccine strategy. Mama added Brussels is not in negotiations with either Russian or Chinese companies. Earlier, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orbán said Budapest has talking with Russia and China for shots as early as December. Moving to Iraq, where two people have been killed and 51 others wounded after a gas pipeline exploded in the southern city of Samawa. Nine paramilitary fighters are among the injured. Police said firefighters have doused the fire after closing the gas line. The reason behind the fire is yet to be determined. Iraqi energy officials said the explosion did not disrupt the country's gas production and processing operations. Now moving to Chile, where the anti-government protesters took to the streets of the Santiago and clashed with police. The protest comes six days after a vote to change the country's constitution. Riot police used tear gas and a water cannon to disperse the crowd. Police say dozens of protesters were arrested. The protests began little over a year ago to call for reforms to the pension, healthcare and education systems.
Now, the U.S. has accused Iran-based hackers of targeting its voters' registration database. In a joint statement, the FBI and Department of the Homeland Security said the hackers sent threatening emails to thousands of Americans. It said the emails asked voters to change party registration and vote for U.S. President Donald Trump. The agency said they are aware of an Iranian advanced persistent threat with the actor targeting U.S. state websites. They said this actor was responsible for the voter intimidation emails and for the re-election related disinformation in mid-October. The U.S. officials have been on high alert over the threat of potential foreign interference in the upcoming November 3rd election. Now, a bear predicted Joe Biden's victory over Donald Trump in the U.S. election. Beyond a brown bear in Siberian Zoo examined two watermelons portraying American presidential candidates. Details in this report. Russia's animal political pundits have weighed in, choosing different candidates to win the 2020 U.S. presidential race. The forecasts of Buyan, Khan and Bartik were calculated with watermelons. Buyan, the male bear, picked the watermelon with Joe Biden's image on it and eagerly sank his teeth into the fruit. It is very simple to interpret the actions of animals. You need to carefully observe what they're trying to say. Considering that our animals were almost equally interested in both watermelons, the fight is going to be extremely difficult. The animals have made their choice. It's an approximate equality of votes. Two other animal experts in Roya Vruchi Zoo sided with an opposing party. Bartek and Amor Tiger set his expectations on Trump immediately, while Khan, a Bengal tiger, played with the image of Biden before finally rolling the Trump's watermelon away. The animals have a lot of time to think, discuss this matter, weigh and analyze. Therefore, in general, their judgments are usually very deep. During the previous Trump's election race, despite the losing position in which the American president has been, all our animals guessed it right. Of course, Trump didn't call back and didn't say thank you. We weren't very mad, but of course, he cannot count on such support from us as before. In 2016, Oracle Bear Buyan predicted Trump's victory. Buyan also predicted the outcome of World Cup games in host country Russia. Americans will be voting for president on November 3rd. Well, now moving on, at least seven people have been killed in a landslide sparked by heavy rains in El Salvador. Government says more than 30 others are missing under a deluge of mud. The mudslide hit the village of Los Angelitos after heavy rains loosened the earth on the flanks of the San Salvador volcano. Civil Protection Agency says the landslide carved a route for four foil kilometers, sweeping mud rocks and tree trunks in its path. Interior Minister Mario Duran called the situation difficult and said around 35 people were buried in the slide. Soldiers with a sniffer dog are working alongside fire crews and civilians to try to unearth the survivors. The Philippines has ordered mass evacuation as the world's strongest typhoon of 2020 approaches the Luzon Island. Emergency officials say Typhoon Goni is Category 5 storm and sustained winds up to 265 kilometers per hour. The official said Goni is expected to make landfall in the Philippines today. They said rescue equipment are positioned in key areas, but due to the pandemic, the emergency funds are extremely insufficient. Authorities said Goni will bring intense rains over the capital and 14 provinces. This will be the strongest typhoon in the Philippines since Haiyan storm that killed over 6,000 people in November 2013. China's manufacturing sector continues to recover in October. The National Bureau of Statistics said the country's purchasing managers in NICS expanded 51.4% in the current month. It said the PMI has been above 51% since July. The stat said despite external uncertainties due to the pandemic, the index continues to expand since March. The index for new export orders stayed at 51%, 0.2% hedge higher than in the previous month. Vice President of the China Federation of Logistics and Purchasing says the PMI of this month shows the Chinese economy is resilient on the whole. Now let's have a look at the weather updates.
Well, that is all for now. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at Indus.news. Take care.